it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, very important event, actually. It's uh, you know, something that uh, UCLA has been doing for at least a year now, or Cindy's been doing, and uh, these are very important events to remind us of our place in the globe and just how important the globe is in terms of our education and our educating our students and um, doing all the research and everything else we do at UCLA. I want to take a moment to uh, thank representatives from the consulates of Afghanistan, Batar, and Thailand for uh, joining us tonight um, uh, and for attending this evening's events. And so please give them a hand. I'm very pleased to have. <laughs> we can't all go out to all places in the globe, but we can have the globe come here. This is one of the nice things about Los Angeles. So I, I think the, my message is very simple. UCLA is committed to providing a global education for its students and a global platform for its faculty to do their research and teaching. Uh, we want to make sure that they have accessible and affordable opportunities, our students do, to study, learn, and volunteer internationally so that they can get a flavor of what the world is really like out there. At this time in our society, in our nation, and in the world, we know that more than ever, our relationships to the greater world, the world beyond Los Angeles, the world beyond UCLA, rests on understanding our differences, global differences, as well as our commonality of experience, those things which can drive us apart, but also those things which pull us together. And we want, our, we want an active student body who are working on precisely those issues of commonality and difference. More than 12,000 international students and researchers are on campus. They enrich our dialogue and learning. We have a very rich environment. We bring the international here to campus through our students, and they play a very, very important role in the campus community and in everything we do. All students should graduate with international experiences. <clears throat> Those experiences broaden their perspective and prepare, prepare them to work in a global economy for their benefit and for the benefit of everybody in society. In a few moments, you'll I'd be very fortunate to hear from Marcelo Suarez Orozco, the dean of our Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. The school is doing timely research within the context of globalization, on education, of course, as well as on immigration and on new technologies. Uh, uh, we're very proud, as a matter of fact, under uh, Dean Suarez Orozco's leadership, the GSEIS Department of Education was named number one uh, graduate, uh, in graduate education program in the uh, nation by the US News and World Report recently, and that's a very great achievement, uh, something that I think we should all be proud of. I listen to, to Marcelo all the time, so I have to apologize in advance, not to him, but to all of you, because I have to leave, because I have another event immediately, but you're going to hear something that you enjoy enormously. I also want to recognize the International Institute's leadership, Cindy Fan, of course, the Vice Provost for uh, International, and Vice Provost, Associate Vice Provost Christopher Erickson, who's over there, and Associate Vice Provost Gail Kligman, whom I didn't see, but was somewhere around. She's not here, okay. And the audience is sprinkled with various dignitaries and deans from the campus, and thank you all for coming. For 60 years, the Institute has been advancing international education research and our many successful global partnerships. It's been a dynamic force on the campus, something that has benefited both ed uh, teaching and research on campus, and still a vital force in our uh, educational mission at UCLA. Thank you all for being here tonight. I hope you enjoy the program, as I'm sure you will, and I hope you enjoy the activities of this week, which are all designed to uh, exalt and to uh, publicize our international and global efforts. So with that, Marcella or Cindy. As Scott mentioned, my name is Cindy Fan. I'm Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement. I'm also a professor of geography uh, in this division of social sciences. Um, the International Education Week is an initiative uh, began, begun by the Department of State and Department of Education for two goals. Uh, one is to promote programs uh, that help Americans to function and, and be effective in the global world. And the second goal is to attract future leaders from abroad to come to the United States to study and to exchange experiences. And three years ago, the International Institute um, invited a few organizing of a few campus units um, to start our own initiative on campus. And this in initiative is to make the International Education Week a campus tradition. So this is our third year doing this. 
And this year we have, I think, 30 sponsors and many sitting among us are sponsors. Uh, your unit has given money, thank you very much. And your units have been listed on our banner, so please take a look at <laughs> your unit's names there. Uh, we have also, I think, about 40 events this week. And if you have picked up the Daily Bruin, you might notice that there is an insert. And this insert has highlighted some of the major events. But if you go to the website, there are more listed there here. So we have something called Comic Art in Russia. That's a great combination. <laughs> And we have uh, a, a, an event on international justice. We have events on international career for our students. Uh, we have martial arts. Um, I think tomorrow evening there's going to be international students event on the hill uh, where there's a fashion show. Um, we have Well Cafe where you can taste coffees and teas from the world. So um, this week it's really uh, full of events. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our organizing partners. In addition to the International Institute, we have the Dashu Center for International Scholars and uh, Students. So please raise your hand when your unit is called. Dashu Center, thank you. Um, International Education Office or, or UCLA Study Abroad, thank you. The UCLA Library, I know Bob is standing behind us. And the Office of Residential Life. There you go. And I also wanted to give a big shout out to the staff of the International Institute. They've worked so hard on this event on this week, and uh, please, next week during Thanksgiving, please spoil yourself because you've earned it. Thank you. And I'm also very grateful for the leadership of the university and uh, not only UCLA, but University of California. So the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, UCLA's Chancellor, Jean Blanc, um, EVC Provost, Scott Ball, they've all made commitment uh, to global education and research, and all the deans who are sitting here also are part of uh, this commitment. So global education and research um, requires us to have a certain mindset. This mindset um, is one where uh, we would reach out, right, and we would also uh, perhaps recognize our own limitations, and also it's a mindset that, uh, that requires us to cross borders. So the tagline, if you look at the Daily Bruin, the tagline of International Education Week is actually connecting across borders. And these borders might be geographic, national, um, racial, ethnic, religious, cultural, and when there's a border, we cross it. When there's a border, we connect. So this is what we do. And uh, students could develop this mindset by studying abroad, by taking a class on uh, world regions, uh, by making friends with people on campus from other countries, uh, or simply exploring the uh, multi-ethnic Los Angeles. And we are very happy that among the audience here, we have many people from the community, including the Council's General. And also, um, I wanted to also highlight uh, one of our uh, good friends who's a former diplomat uh, from Thailand, Kantati, where are you sitting? And also one of our alumni. Thank you for coming, Kantati. And we welcome and look forward to your sharing your passion and experience with us uh, in terms of connecting across borders. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dean Marcelo Suarez Orozco. He's the inaugural UCLA Wasserman Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. His research focuses on cultural psychology and psychological anthropology with an emphasis on globalization, education, and global migration. He has numerous award-winning books published by Harvard University Press, UC Press, and, and the like, 
and he regularly contributes to national and international media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, NPR, etc. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, a trustee of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and he's the recipient of the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, which is the highest order that Mexico uh, can award to a foreigner. He also has served as a special advisor to the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. He's an immigrant from Argentina, and he's also a product of the California Master Plan, having studied in uh, community college and UC Berkeley, where he earned his PhD in anthropology. And earlier this year, His Holiness Pope Francis appointed Dean Suarez Orozco, academic, academician of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. And four months ago, uh, Dean Suarez Orozco was named, listen, a great immigrant is actually a title. <laughs> he was named a great immigrant by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And um, I had the privilege of traveling to South America with uh, Marcelo a few years ago. And I can assure you he's funny, he's charismatic. The whole time I was in South America with him, there wasn't a dull moment. He kept us entertained. And I can't think of uh, a better person to speak on this topic, education for the global era. Please join me in, in welcoming Dean Marcelo Orozco. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. That was the kind of introduction that my father would have liked and my mother would have believed. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so delighted. I want to thank the provost uh, for his kind words. I want to thank... Um, Cindy, I want to welcome the members of the Diplomatic Corps, fellow deans, um, colleagues, professors, members of the faculty, staff, and above all, uh, our students, our UCLA students. So thank you. Thank you for that warm uh, welcome. What I'd like to do today is share some thoughts on, uh, on uh, globalization and how it may or may not relate to how we think about uh, education. I'm going to focus on uh, K-12 education, but there are obvious issues that are pertinent to um, higher education as well, and perhaps we can um, in endeavor to address those, uh, those issues in our uh, exchange, in our conversation following the presentation. So I'll start with a claim, and the claim is that in some ways, well, globalization is very old, it's very ancient, it's really uh, fundamentally and constitutive of the human condition, and we can identify various waves of globalization, and historians have done that. Um, I want to reduce and simplify matters, and I want to start with a claim that perhaps globalization 1.0 came about with the rise of new technologies, the collapse of all walls, the Berlin Wall above all. And in a way, the, uh, the, uh, the emergence of new patterns of, uh, of um, migration worldwide. If that then is the dawn of globalization 1.0, globalization 2.0 maybe can be dated as of September 15th, uh, 2008, uh, that was the day Lehman Brothers uh, collapse and began a global, a global um, economic um, malaise, um, a virulent economic recession, uh, the rise of new social media as an instrument for many things, above all mass uprisings that we witnessed in the multiple uh, Arab, uh, the so-called Arab uh, spring or Arab Springs. And of course, the third and most um, worrisome, notable of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, formations that usher the, 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 what 
I will tentatively call globalization 2.0, is the rise of xenophobic, anti-immigrant, anti-globalization nativism in the world, uh, the world uh, over. So what, uh, how, as a, as a matter of sort of um, thinking about um, definitions, I find this quite economic and quite simple. This is my former colleague, Joan Coatsworth, who is the current provost at, at uh, Columbia, uh, who defined in an uh, endeavor that we did uh, together, uh, globalization as what happens when the, good, the movement of people, of goods, of ideas among countries and regions uh, accelerates. And we've seen multiple, various cycle of these uh, accelerations. And um, uh, I think this remains a good working definition for what we mean by globalization as a socioeconomic uh, phenomenon. Sorry, I'm confused because it's given me the, the wrong. So this is the definition. Uh, clearly, we are in the age of movement. Uh, and this remains the case, even in the context of the returns of, of walls of, of various kinds. Every second, approximately 25 people will close, cross a national border. Um, last year, there were well over a billion national crossings. From the time you got up this morning to the time you go um, to bed tonight, a trillion dollars will have crossed national boundaries. And in many ways, the integration and disintegration of markets, the, of technologies, of media, and of demographics are at the very heart of what we call um, globalization uh, today. And movement certainly is, um, is a piece of this. And we, of course, are keenly aware in universities, there isn't a university today, or maybe there was never a university where global issues as we now understand them weren't really constitutive and at the center of how the university, capital U, came to be in its present uh, uh, form. The global era is increasingly defined by the, uh, the denationalization or the internationalization of production, distribution, and consumption of good and goods and services. This has been fueled by growing levels of international trade, foreign direct investment, and capital flows, to the emergence of increasingly borderless information, communication, and media technologies that enable the deterritorialization of broad sectors of the economy, stimulate the traffic of data, symbols, ideas, and place a premium on knowledge-intensive work. New information, communication, and media technologies integrate the production and distribution of goods. Uh, they also integrate the, or accelerate, the exchange of symbols, of ideas, of desires. And I think by now it's obvious that they both stimulate utopia and dystopia at once. Even in the most remote regions of the world, uh, today, uh, folk are connected and in touch. And um, we see this. Uh, all over, uh, all over the world, but people do have now very obvious, very deep concerns about um, about uh, globalization. These are just some data on the trends. The the uh, the main indicators here are foreign uh, direct investment, uh, the uh, uh, merchandise export as a total share of the economy, and migrant and the movement of people. So, so these would be like three very significant indices of what we call globalization uh, in the 21st century. Um, I will now turn my attention to what I think is one of the defining uh, features of, um, of uh, globalization, and that is a world on the move. And in many ways, um, immigration is the human face of globalization. It is the, the, the sounds, it's the, the aromas, it's the colors of a world that is increasingly um, um, interconnected, it's increasingly miniaturized, and it's increasingly uh, fragile. And this is the world of the, the, uh, the movement uh, of, uh, of people. 
the center of uh, the human face of globalization, of mass migration, is Asia today. It's not the Americas, it's not North America, it's Asia, I would say, like the center of so many other things. Everything is slowly migrating, you can use that as a metaphor, to uh, Asia. Asia today has um, the majority of transnational migrants, um, and e Asia and Europe, in fact, um, together account for uh, over 60% of the mass movements of people. North America is uh, a third, uh, followed by Africa and other regions of the world. Europe and North America attract approximately slightly less than half of the world's immigrants. And there is um, some, um, it's important to keep in mind the, the evolving nature, the transformational nature of the movements of people. Europe once led the world on emigration. Think that from the end of the Napoleonic Wars into the first decade of the 20th century, Europe sent over 60 million people to the New World. Now you look at the numbers and as if by centennial design, Europe recaptured its lost population in the form of new immigrants. Europe struggles with the immigration and no immigrants, I think present an important point of comparison to the North American experience. Of course, Canada and the U.S. are countries with long, long histories of uh, mass migrations. So to paraphrase Tolstoy's beautiful first line in Anna Karenina, when it comes to immigration, let's say uh, all of the countries of the post-industrial world are unhappy in each in their own way, and we can go through how uh, this is unfolding. Here are the most uh, the data. The, the world, every continent now is facing large numbers of, uh, of uh, immigrants. What's interesting and new and perhaps different is that really uh, the number of countries that are now experiencing immigration, emigration, transit, return, migration, and unauthorized or irregular forms of migration is uh, um, growing. And in, in fact, every continent on earth is dealing with all four categories at once. That is immigration, emigration, um, transit, and return. Uh, migration. Our country has the largest number of immigrants in history. We are percentage-wise slightly below the peak of, uh, of mass migration and still the United States has four times more immigrants than the second largest country of immigration and it's new the fact that Saudi Arabia made it to the top. Historically the, the Russian Federation had um, uh, 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 for, for many, many years, attracted very, very large numbers of, uh, of immigrants. That is no longer uh, the case. So clearly, uh, immigration is a defining feature of this new global era we all uh, are living in. Of course, our understandings of globalization are changing. Globalization is not new. We can think of globalization as, as, as uh, having uh, very, very uh, uh, old history, uh, begins. Uh, you've seen the new data with the new genetic, with the new uh, genetic studies uh, were remapping the cartography of the movements of people, and this is all very exciting. You see periodically science and, uh, or anyway, some of us who cheat read the New York Times version of what science reports. But you, there is a lot of very fascinating and important new data. Just last week, I think Science released the new, this very significant study on the arrival of, of our first Americans uh, to, our, to our continent probably 14,000 years ago and the nature of the relationships between the various waves of, uh, of uh, immigrants into our country. And of course, in our country, immigration is history and destiny. It's how the country came to be in its present form. And as we turn to education momentarily, the only sector of the U.S. child population that is growing now is the immigrant origin sector. So at every moment in the making of the, of the American journey, immigration has been defining from the arrival of the first peoples 14, 15,000 years ago 
to the explorers, to the involuntary movement of African slaves, to the various ways of, uh, of immigration, old and new, it defines the condition of how our country came to be in its present uh, form. Things change, uh, the depth of change, and in some ways, may, maybe one of the arguments to, to, to make is that education uh, has a new role in this era of uh, global uh, interconnected uh, economies and societies of the, 20, uh, of the 21st uh, uh, century. Of course, we now, it's very obvious that globalization makes cultural uh, difference and diversity increasingly normative in the world's mega cities. Our cities, like LA, are more diverse in terms of languages, religions, ethnicities, colors, than races than ever before. Uh, you look at the global cities, and this is increasingly what defines the nature of life in the cities, whether this is Vancouver or, or, or Toronto or Milano or New York or LA. Uh, diversity defines the demographic, sociocultural, and linguistic reality in the world. In New York City, this morning, uh, about half the kids that got up to go to schools, got into subways to go to school, are come from um, immigrant-headed uh, households, half the children. Of course, in California, that's been the case for some time, uh, over half of our children now are uh, originating in immigrant origin homes. What's interesting is that this is now the case in uh, nearly every high and increasingly most middle-income countries in, in, in the world. OECD data show that for the OECD countries, uh, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, are uh, roughly a, a quarter of all children in uh, all the OECD countries now come from immigrant and refugee origin uh, homes. So this is um, uh, a very significant feature. Uh, and in a way, um, what we see in cities like Los Angeles is something that uh, we've never seen before. What's the second largest Mexican city? Well, obviously it's LA, but that's, uh, the, what, what's the second largest Mexican city? What's the correct answer? It's Guadalajara. Now, there are more citizens of Mexico in LA than there are citizens of Mexico in Guadalajara, making us de facto, de jure, the second largest Mexican city in the world. What's amazing is that this is increasingly the case for a very large number of, um, of countries the world over. Thomas Jefferson once said, we all have two cities, our own and what did the, all the founding fathers love? The city of lights. We all have two cities, Jefferson said. Our own and Paris. What's there not to love about Paris, right? Well, the world has, today has two capitals, their own and LA. We are the second capital for countries as varied as, as Armenia, Israel, uh, Mexico, of course, Guatemala, Korea, and the list goes on and on and on. This is new and this is extraordinarily important in that it gives rise to, I think, a new conceptual category, which we may call the global, that is the global and the local fusing in our own, uh, in our own uh, neighborhoods. Clearly, what we see today, and this would be an interesting point for discussion, is that the ideal of the German romantics, of an imagined fit between language, identity, uh, the land, uh, right, that's a folk in the herders, is made increasingly anachronistic by the forces of globalization. Today, um, it is not only the great cities like Los Angeles that to quote from Walt Whitman in one of the most beautiful lines in the English language, it's not just the cities that contradict themselves containing multitudes. This is true increasingly the world over. Uh, this is true in cities such as Reggio Emilia, a little city that gave the world the best preschools it's ever seen. But this is true in Oslo and Stockholm. This is true in Dodge City, Kansas. I was recently in Dodge City on a radio program and it's something like half of the children in the kindergarten now are non-English speaking come from immigrant origin homes. So the message to me in the radio was we're not in Kansas anymore when half the kids speak a language other than, than English. So they call forth for re a reaffirmation of the promise of democracy, which needs to be taken as a fragile and um, as a condition that's the great John Dewey. I'm now making a plug for education. The great John Dewey 100 years ago in the, what's 
probably still remains the most important book written in our country on education, announced the work of education is the work of the work of democracy is the work of education and it's the work that each generation needs to um, do uh, and renew uh, uh, anew again uh, in each uh, generation. Uh, the great Thomas Mann, in another context, in his BBC lectures that he gave from the Pacific Palisades, by the way, said prophetically the condition of democracy should not be taken as for granted. It's a, it's a fragile condition. So how do we then re, uh, reimagine um, the democratic compact in an age where the globalization is a, such a central feature of economies and societies the world over. Why is this related, relevant or significant to education? The face of, um, of immigration and globalization in the 21st century is increasingly youthful. Uh, this is the great Salgado, the extraordinary Brazilian photographer, and the, the data are um, breathtaking today. Um, one in eight migrants is a child. This is the world over. Uh, the um, worldwide, one of every 200 children is a refugee or has been forcefully displaced by uh, violence or by environmental dystopia. Increasingly, that's what defines the new migrations. This is double the number of just a decade ago. According to UN figures, there are um, 28 million, probably closer to 30, forcefully displaced children. Uh, another 20 million are international migrants. Their combined number now is larger than the populations of Canada and Sweden combined. Millions of children are internal um, uh, immigrants. Uh, China alone, more children separated by migration than there are people in Canada probably between 30 and 40 million children that are separated from their families in the context of internal uh, migration. And, uh, and um, the same is true for uh, uh, India, by the way. So again, the epicenter of the global movements in the 21st century is now um, Asia. In the 21st century, then, the data show that under the best of circumstances, migration separate children from their families, disrupt familiar bonds. To migrate in the 21st century is to separate families. And of course, we've seen the barbarian practice of um, removing children from their parents and putting children uh, in cage. And if you think that the work of democracy is finished, you have to just look at those um, um, uh, data to have your thoughts uh, disrupted. Immigration generates a very powerful echo. As families reunify, the children of immigrants take the center stage. Children of immigrants are the fruit born of immigration. I have a definition of immigration, an N of one. Most of the immigration scholars in the room will disagree with me, but immigration is, in my definition, an ethical act of and for the family. At the distal level, there are many, many mechanisms that predict the migration. It can't be reduced to facile, vulgar algorithms because it's very complex. And at the, but at the proximate level, uh, migration is an affair of the family. The family begins the process of immigration, and a family, will, which will be completely transformed by the process, will finish the, the process several generations down, uh, down the road. In our country today, 20, uh, over 26% of children under age, a total of almost 20 million children, uh, originate in immigrant home origin homes. The growth has been very, very rapid. The children of immigrants are, of course, an integral part of the national uh, tapestry. And this is a global phenomenon. Globally, immigrant children are the fastest growing sector of the child population in countries as desperate, desperate as Canada. Well, over 90% of the growth in Canada moving forward will be the children of immigrant, immigrants, but this is true also in Italy, Australia, Israel, New Zealand. Let me just give you some data that will take your breath away. Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague. Rotterdam is the largest port in the heart of Europe. Two-thirds of the children that woke up this morning got into bikes and bike to school. Two-thirds of the children come from non-Dutch 
immigrant and refugee origin home, homes, two thirds. In Stockholm, 40% of the children in the Stockholm schools today come from immigrant and refugee origin homes. In Milano, over 35% of the children in, 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 uh, in schools come from non-Italian immigrant and refugee origin homes. So this is the future of a number. Berlin, 40% of the children. Germany is a very fascinating case, a country of 82 million people, rapidly aging population, below replacement fertility rate. The Germans, unlike us, have a real system, meaning a, a worker in the system is paying for an actual retiree. We fake it. Social security is, 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 is not a one-to-one. -one. Germany, 82 million people. You do the math, one generation, two generations. Past three generations, the great the, the Massimo Levi Vaci, the greatest is a demographer alive today says this is the, you leave science and you enter the domain of uh, science fiction, but you do the math that Germany in two generations will shrink. It's shrinking, it's in the process of massive uh, population decline. It goes from 82 million to something like 20 million in, in, in a, according to a variety of models developed by the Bertelsmann Foundation and by several German and international uh, demographers. So this is the future of um, uh, uh, the world. Now education then is more important today than ever before in human history and it will be more important uh, than ever uh, moving uh, forward. Each additional year of school is very uh, now connected in ways that are empirically very much clearer than we understood to lower fertility, increase health and financial well-being. And literacy has now, we have uh, something um, that is uh, very clear. Uh, literacy saves lives, literally. And this was announced uh, 150 years ago. Darwin was in the ship, he was doing the notebooks, and in the note, it, he has a marginal comment in the notebooks when he says something prophetic, educate girls, and then he has the multiplication sign equals two, two times. Educate the girls twice the, the, the effort. This is 100 years before the World Bank did the study to all studies showing that the path for so much um, wellness goes through the education of um, girls and, uh, and um, uh, uh, women. And now we understand the, the causal pathways by which this happens, probably the best work on this, my former colleague Catherine Snow at Harvard and Bob Levine, also at Harvard, uh, did a very, very important work showing how the bureaucratic registry, which is the language of, of, um, of health, um, it, it, uh, transforms how, how um, people, women, uh, above all, children, the world over, connect with and make sense and are able to advocate for health and well-being. Furthermore, of course, the problems of today are problems that have a deep, deep uh, education um, um, relevance. You know, uh, Thomas Piketty wrote this book. It's kind of like the bell curve that Mary wrote many years ago with Hernstein. It's a book that nobody read, but everybody had in their home. It's like 6,000 pages. It's uh, this Gallic treatise. It's called uh, Capital in the 21st Century, somewhat provocative title. I read most of it, not all of it, but most of it, and I did get to the point where he argues, other than uh, education, that is the distribution of skill, uh, there are no other, other than a kind of a massive redistribution mechanism, there aren't so many pathways to disrupt the number one threat to the liberal democracies of the 21st century, which is inequality. So more is asked of education. In fact, more is asked of education than of almost anything else. There is an, another domain uh, where we ask uh, uh, of uh, to solve uh, poverty, the, uh, dystopia, inequality, hate uh, than uh, than education. So big, big expectations for for education, and uh, that's why education is the most important domain, and now I'm not speaking like just as the dean of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies, but it is such a central, central domain uh, for us to think about the common good and the pathway moving forward. When, we, when it comes to education, again, uh, Tolstoy, uh, countries are unhappy in their own way. In the post-industrial nations, boredom is the elephant in the classroom. We did a study like 
30 years ago now, I think. Very simple. We had kids fill in the sentence. It's a sentence completion task. It's a very simple task. Uh, school is. And the answer? The boring. The school is boring. And now what's amazing is I asked the, the, uh, the former labor minister of education in, uh, in Israel, and without missing a beat, I didn't even finish it, she said boring. I asked the, the first woman speaker of the Bundestag, the uh, Rita Susmuth, also Minister of Education. Without finishing the sentence, she said boring. Uh, the, you asked the Minister of Education in Brazil. I don't know, we have the consuls here from various diplomatic uh, um, uh, offices. Uh, take it to your country and uh, send me an email on what the answer is. The answer is boring. Uh, this is the uh, elephant in the classroom. And by the way, it is a great achievement because the human brain, um, it's wired to learn. It, learning is a condition of, of, of humanity. It's, it's, it's really deeply, deeply baked into the central nervous system. So to achieve boredom is a great uh, work. You have to work very hard to get uh, kids bored. And if you're a minority kid, by the way, if you're a boy particularly of color, you, the affect, the phenomenology of experience in schools every day is really boredom or fear. Again, brain scientists, and there may be some brain scholars here in the, in the audience, that's not the ideal formula for learning and for engagement. So this is a, a real issue, uh, boredom. And of course, we have uh, the, the, uh, this eternal, elusive quest for uh, equality. That is such an unfinished agenda in our country, but uh, increasingly the world over. Again, uh, the piece of data, that's the... PISA is the Program for International Student Assessment. This is very, very, um, uh, this is, um, this moves the needle in that every Secretary of the Treasury in the world and every Minister of Education in the world, that's just what they are uh, weight uh, every, in, a, in, a, uh, every in, in the cycle, I think the cycle is every th four years or every three years, we have, a, we have a, uh, somebody to, to, to give us the exact uh, number, and everybody's doing a very careful Talmudic, Talmudic exegesis of what exactly the data say and what is uh, most likely to move uh, the needle. In fact, I had a very amazing conversation with a former labor uh, minister of education in Israel who told me every time the, the, uh, the labor prime minister would summon her to the office for anything, the secretary of the treasury was there and the only questions that were really interested in education is, so how do we get the, the PISA data to improve? How do we get the, the, our kids to do better? Everybody wants to be like Finland, and like Shanghai. And uh, I had a very fascinating exchange with the Finnish um, Secretary of Education. For the first time, the G20 took on education and they asked the, the minister and I to speak about global education. And um, my main message to the, to the audience was, um, everybody wants to be like Finland. And we have a lot of Finlands in the United States. We have a lot of little Finlands in the United States, meaning we have schools that are doing an amazing, an amazing job. But if you really want to understand Finland, you need to start with a Lutheran culture that has zero tolerance for inequality. Beyond that, good luck trying to copy uh, Finland. Good luck trying to copy Reggio Emilia, another the, the sensibility that is so flows, where so much flows for the, from the idea of the citizen and for the idea of, of equality. So. Um, this is the elusive quest for uh, educational equality. Is, uh, this is the issue defined in many, many countries, our own, of course, uh, numero uno, but also so many other high and increasingly middle income countries uh, the world over. And uh, if the PISA message is that if you want to move the GDP, and if education is Im implicated in moving the, the, uh, the GDP, uh, you need to uh, do better with more broader sectors of the, of the child population uh, performing and doing and flourishing. When the Greeks first imagined the idea of education as we now understand it, they fundamentally thought of education as the eudaimonic flourishing of every child to their full uh, potential. And this has been a, a, um, a, a, a theme. In a way, I've, 20 years ago, I wrote a book on globalization and education, and I articulated this, uh, what we then call the convergent hypothesis, meaning that 
um, there is something happening the world over, and that is the skills, the sensibilities, the competencies, the cognitive and metacognitive skills that globalization in increasingly requires of all our citizens are being deterritorialized, and the competition today is global. And um, even as walls are returning, even as we may be uh, in, um, um, what's the way of saying this? Maybe in, um, we got carried away, there was a headline of uh, Dewey defeats uh, Truman in the papers, right? We buried globalization. We we buried the idea, the Herderian idea of of uh, of the the Savoke and the, the, the deep nationalist uh, notions that uh, created so much destruction uh, in so many parts of the world. Perhaps that was uh, a little uh, um, 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 before we should have. Uh, it's very obvious that uh, there are new basic skills that flow from the global field in which all our children are growing up um, today. In some ways, uh, there are eternal questions. Uh, education systems the world um, over are facing unprecedented challenges, but also unprecedented opportunities. Educating more diverse cohorts of young people to greater levels of competency at a time when economies and societies are more integrated and they're more vulnerable to global upheavals. The forces shaping the lives of children and youth growing up today are an ever more complex network of interlink micro, meso, and macro variables. The local realm, the realm of the family, the neighborhood, the school, the church, synagogue, the temple, the national realm are thoroughly enmeshed in global processes. Basic paradigm of education and schooling always wedded to the ideological and cultural and historical DNA of the autonomous, sovereign, and inviolate nation state is somewhat anachronistic and in many ways out of touch with the vectors that rule the world today. Yet the old adage that all education is local endures. But think again. We live in a world where a disaster in uh, another region of the world is a disaster at home. Uh, we, our world is miniaturized and is extraordinarily uh, uh, fragile. I want to make a, a plea for, uh, for culture, for language, for admiring diversity, uh, not uh, approaching uh, diversity as a problem to be overcome, but rather as an opportunity to admire and to put to work to the fundamental humanistic ideal of finding yourself in another. The world is more complex and our children will be in growing up in worlds where their lives will be increasingly interlinked to the lives of children growing up in very diverse national, cultural, linguistic um, uh, uh, worlds. The fortunes of children growing up today, whether it's in Los Angeles, whether it's in Berlin, or Bologna, Vancouver, is tied directly and powerful ways to the fortunes of children growing up in Helmet or Kandahar province. We need to think carefully about how the integration, disintegration of economies and societies demand a new agenda for education and schooling of all children here and there. And of course, the children from there who are now living here. We're now truly in the proverbial vote, and either we work together to navigate it, or alone we will continue to hit multiplying global icebergs, threatening to drown all of us. Deep poverty, increasingly and more diverse and obscene inequalities, environmental degradation, catastrophic climate changes, and mass migrations that are increasingly dystopic in nature. While the practical results of education should be lauded, that uh, I will claim is the beginning uh, of the conversation. What is the purpose here, I ask, at a, the great public research university? What is the purpose of a formal education? What are its relationships to eudaimonia, to the happy life worth living? How can education be put to service of human freedom, dignity, solidarity, and long life engagement? While these are essential questions that have been part of our, the archaeology of education in many traditions, Western, Eastern, and many others, globalization subverts the parochial tendency to limit our thinking 
to the realities of the bounded nation states, especially in the current political context. The paradox remains that while education is local, the deep problems that face our future, whether it's unchecked climate change, the mass catastrophic migrations of the 21st century, or the, 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 literally the world burning, as we see uh, today very, very near to where we gather, the problems of the 21st century are indisputably global, global. The tensions between these two powerful truths are increasingly obvious. All, only the education of all children and youth in California will leave us out of the paradox that we live local lives in a global world. Thank you very much.